No, I didn't. No, I can't remember when I said it was going to be. Because episode 50 was supposed to be situationship. And then things happen. People get murdered and killed. And you kind of have to stop the plan to talk about the things that are relevant. So we ended up talking, doing the gun debate last week. And this week, uh, doing the episode I've been itching to do for a while. I had it planned different ways. And then I thought, all right, if this ain't going to work, I know who's the perfect person I want to talk to because, hell, so far, so far, as far as I can tell, it's the one show that I do that or, that was done that everyone at some or not everyone people still talk about today. Like I still get emails saying, "Man, that one girl, man, she had some inspirational shit," and I don't know, she just made me want to step up, step my shit up. Of all 50 some odd episodes, it's like it's one of the early ones. People loved it. I mean, we kicked it out proper. So it's crazy how this episode kind of, kind of, this guest essentially, it makes itself right, right back around at the right time. And we'll get to why here in just a second. But got the homegirl Chanel Bosch back again. Hello. Hello. So, this make three. So right now, no one has done more than three episodes of the show. So now you consider alumni. Now you officially, oh, wow. I'm kind of famous alumni. No one has did a, a, a more than three episodes. So everyone who's been multiple times have essentially did three episodes. But before we oh, get to dang. that, before we get to that, uh, make sure you go to the Kind of Famous Podcast on Facebook, K-I-N-D-A Famous Pod, Facebook.com slash kind of famous part uh that's why I, I post all this uh content to go with what i'm talking about from links to whatever the conversation video clips excerpts whatever all goes on to the facebook page facebook.com slash kind of famous part as well make sure you go subscribe do all that stuff that people tell you to do on itunes google music stitcher anywhere you listen to podcasts if this is your first episode subscribe get with that uh, what else I got? Arrowfilms.com. A-R-O-W-E films.com. That's my personal website. Actually, we're going to switch some things up with the podcast. We're going to go ahead and get the, the, the proper domain name. That way it's easy to search or, or look up the uh, the show online. But for now, Arrowfilms.com. While you're over there, go over to the Redbubble link. Get them clean-ass people collectors. You can still get my book, Wi-Fi Rock Bottom. Something about meth. It's a dope book. People still buying it. I appreciate it. Now, all that bullshit out of the way, we're going to get to the show. Now, this week's show, we're going to talk a little bit about everything. And it's going to seem all, all over the place, but all this shit, I think, going to tie in well. Uh, because March, I'm on my black NPR swag right now. We talking the serious shit, and we digging deep with the black NPR. So, this is what IKF is going to be in March is black NPR. We did the gun debate. We got some other shit coming up pretty soon I want to talk about. But before we're going to get to the show, one last thing. Situation shit was a blast. I'm I'm glad that everybody that came out to the live event with me, Autumn Black, Big Sam, Samuel David, we, I mean, y'all let me get these jokes off. 
I had to go ahead and, you know, do a little crowd work, work the crowd a little bit. But everybody was in good spirits, good fun. We was able to talk about relationships, side niggas, ain't shit niggas, uh, bad relationship, toxic relationship, marriage, and all that sort of thing. We had some great sponsors that gave away some great gifts, some touch body works to BU Beauty, to uh, who had Big Walk Apparel. Um, and we was able to give away tickets to the I Got Soul sneaker con that's coming up real soon the march madness uh, edition of that uh and as well of what they're doing with the i got so uh sneaker convention is they for every person that brings uh a pair of socks they will also get an entry into a raffle because the socks are for a charitable uh, a charitable cause to help with homeless um homeless people and getting them uh adequate uh gear basically clothes but you know people need socks socks is always welcome a lot of the uh polling say that homeless people appreciate socks more than anything else so that's what they're going to be doing if you bring some socks to the ict guys i mean i got soul sneaker convention at wichita state university coming up uh here in march during the uh march madness um uh, tournament that's happening in town you'll get a free um entry into the raffle so Make sure you do that. I got so I ICT got so on what Instagram and I got so dot com. So now we can get to the show. I'm tired of talking about all the stuff that ain't got nothing to do with the show. But Chanel. See, last Hi. time last time you talked to me, <laughs> I wasn't this popping. Fifty, right, show, 50 right. episodes in, <laughs> now I'm out of here. I got I got shit I gotta say before I start the show now. I see. My God, now you really kind of famous. Like, whoa. I know, right? I know it's crazy. <laughs> but I'm gonna, t- I'm gonna tell you what's dope. I'm gonna tell you the dopest thing about what's happening right now is mm-hmm. I kind of feel like I don't want to say we was ahead of the curve, but the first episode of I'm Kind of Famous podcast, we we got in this thing together and we talked about the Get Out movie. Mm-hmm. And when we talked about it, we talked about this black renaissance that was happening and all these shows and things that we got that that has the potential to be something. And here mm-hmm. we are a year later, and pretty much melanin been popping. <laughs> it's just been popping. Popping. Yes. Well, yes. How, you, how you feel about yes. this Get Out? This Get Out got the the Academy, uh, was that best? Was it screen screenplay, original screenplay? Yes. Um, I mean, you know, we knew that it was going to be up for awards this season. Um, I don't think that that was a surprise to anyone, or it shouldn't have been. I mean, I, I think some people were like, uh had their doubts because it was such a revolutionary film and the, in the, just based on the topic, you know? And I think some people thought like, nah, they're going to play us. They're not going to, they're not going to let something like that get nominated, let alone win anything. But good work speaks for itself. And I think that um, there's been so many movements, like you said, like, Black Renaissance, there's been so much going on and there have been so many projects coming out back to back on both television and film, um, as well as digital services like Netflix and, um, you know, Amazon and all those things. There's been so much content being created with minorities uh, that is like you kind of can't ignore it. If you continue to ignore it and not give these people their due, then you can no longer deny your racism. You see what I'm saying? Like, at this point, it's so much out there that's doing numbers. So if they were to deny this film, it would be like, okay, there we go, point in case. You know what I mean? So they kind of had to do something. So I'm not surprised that it won. It deserved it, you know, but I'm also, I feel like it was it was a move that had to be made, too. Man, you said something that I'm going to put it, I'm going to park, because we're going to get back to it on that whole <laughs> racist aspect. We're going to jump. I'm going to jump back. I'm. We're going we gonna to hold. We're going to park that piece, because that's going to come up. 
Um, right, right, right. With Get Out, what the fuck? Oh, I was looking it up and I was trying to find it, but um, there was a moment in time that I believe, and I'm trying to pull it up, but they said that they submitted Get Out as a comedy in 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 one of the uh academy categories uh right. and i'm trying to look up what uh if um was that for the academy or was it for fag uh see I, i'm looking it up if it was uh oh no okay here we go here we go here we go uh, it was the Golden Globes. Get Out received two Golden nominations for right. Best Motion Picture Musical or Comedy and Best Actor Comedy or Musical. Uh, with uh, man, I ain't gonna fuck up his name, but the lead actor, <laughs> Daniel Kalu- Kaluuya. Kalu- Kalu- Kaluuya, yeah. So is that that? And now I don't know specifically how this system works, but. It seems so out of uh out of play <laughs> to put I should I just say insulting <laughs> to submit that that way. Musical Yeah, man. I you know they try now, okay. So <laughs> when that news broke, of course. A lot of people were like, what are you talking about, right? But let's <laughs> like, not say oh, people. This, this Niggas went crazy. Like, hold on now. Right. Y'all, now y'all being disrespectful. Right. And, um, you know, the studio, um, they gave a reason. They said that it was, in or- it was done in order to give the movie higher chances of winning because the other other category that it would have been nominated in was too stacked and they didn't think that it would uh they thought that it would get knocked out in that category so they put it in comedy um so that it would have higher chances of winning and the reason that they were able to say with comedy this is what i've heard repeatedly which i completely disagree with but whatever is they're trying to say that lil rel was a big comedy now, my thing is, Lil Rel was funny. Yeah, he's great. Whatever. There's a difference between being comedic relief and something now being classified as comedy. And comedic relief is a characteristic of the horror genre. Mm. There's always someone who's a little silly, who either knows everything or doesn't know anything at all, who... Um, is lighthearted, who wants to party, who there's always that character in every horror film. I mean, let's think about Scream, let's think about uh, you know, all the Jason movies, all there's always something comedic or someone who is lighthearted. Um, Lil Rel character wasn't just comedic relief though, he was the voice of reason. So to mm-hmm. diminish him, like, yeah, he is a comedian. So, okay, great, we're saying he's funny. We already knew that he's a comedian. His name is Lil Rel. <laughs> he goes by <laughs> Lil Rel. Like, you know, but but you're diminishing the work that he did in that film by just saying, now you're saying he's just a comedian and he was just comedic relief because he was the voice of reason in the film, which means that he was the all-knowing person, right? He was the person who knew what was going to happen. He's the person who saved the day. So he's much more than the comedic relief. So you're not only um, diminishing the film itself and the point of the film, the mm. whole message and thread but you're diminishing the work that the actor did as well um and you're using and also like he was great but he was only in the very beginning of the movie the very beginning and the very end so he may have had a total is, 10 minute screen time possibly 10 minutes. right exactly so how is that i want to say it was probably seven honestly so how was that one character who was introduced in the beginning and didn't come back until the end when he saved the day. How does that character determine the genre of the entire film? A whole lot of shit happened in between. And oddly funny. enough was- that <laughs> Daniel Kaluuya was up in that particular mm-hmm. award show was up for best actor in a comedy or musical. 
So, yeah, like, right. like even then, if we're going to play comedy and music, it's almost like the one with the jokes. Well, granted, Daniel had some jokes for me. I mean, he had all the yeah. – he had me laughing, not purposely, you know, but it was – but we'll 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 sidestep that and 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 understand but understand that disrespect and we'll go to the academy which it was up for best oh, wait, can picture. I just, go ahead. I'm sorry. I want to make a, I want to make a comment because every time when I've talked about this the the comedy thing you know the only people who have said yeah there were funny moments or you know Daniel was funny or Lil Rel was funny or whoever have been men. <laughs> And I just want to point. I just want to take a second to point out <laughs> that this was not funny in any way to black women. Like black women were just sitting there sucking their teeth. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> was it nothing funny about? It? it was too real. <laughs> yeah, that's why it was funny because I was like, man, that's some real shit right there. We've been trying to tell you. We've been trying to tell you. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you. You know what? This was one. This was the. This was the anchor moment. Well, black men was to me, I got to stop fucking with these white girls, man. That was the moment. <laughs> then Black Panther said, you know what? We done with these white hoes. I don't even want no white people touching me right now. Just don't uh-huh. even, don't even right. look this way. But we'll get to Black Panther. The Academy uh, uh-huh. nominated Get Out for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, and Best Original Screenplay. So it's weird how it was too stacked for one, and then it was right in the pocket for another. But then, right. you know, Oscar's so black. I wonder how much of that played into making sure that that was nominated for a, uh, you know, best picture. Because, I mean, you know, often, more often than not, well, horror movies generally don't uh, find itself nominated in the best picture category. But also being a horror and then being a black film, essentially, and apparently a comedy you know, to be able to sit in that pocket was was uh, appreciated, but I wonder if it was a right. a quota move, affirmative action move right. by the academy. But you I know, I mean, that was just. I don't want. Hey, know, hold on, was, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't fuck up now. Uh, <laughs> don't fuck up your money now. <laughs> there was a couple of moves. There was a couple of moves. Let's just say I know a couple of nominations that were like, oh, okay. All right, anyway. yeah, we ain't gonna have, yeah. I'm gonna tell you, I ain't gonna let you jump too far off that ledge. Let <laughs> me say the fucked up shit. I ain't acting shit. Anything I'm doing is independent. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I mean, like I said, it's dope that we could come back full circle and then have this discussion at a very, I, I think one of the best moments or, or greatest moments in black entertainment. Um, that we've probably had in the, I mean, I almost want to say ever, but a very long time uh, to be able to have mm-hmm. a movie like this. That's not, you know, it's not just the movie. And hold on, let me look at my list of topics because, yeah, we'll do this. All right. It's not just that it's a movie. It is so much underlining, um, I don't I don't know the right word but it's 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 so much of the shit that we deal with day to day embedded in this movie. Um I mean we talked about this you can you know in the episode 1 of the I'm kind of famous podcast the get out <laughs> episode we break this whole movie down uh pretty I mean with with a lot of topics and things that we miss but like our movies are starting to movies and TV shows are starting to really capture the black experience, even when it's kind of disguised by all these other things. It's like, this is kind of funny or this is kind of scary or this is kind of entertaining, but we're really putting our culture right in your face. And like you said earlier, at some point, if you're not looking at this and recognizing that, you kind of have to question, or I begin to question, are you... Do you have a real racial bias that you can't see the shit that's happening right in front of you? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'm going to let you come in on yeah. that. I got to take a drink. <laughs> I mean, um, I think, yeah, man, people don't realize that they have a racial bias. People think, you know, 
what are you talking about? I don't have a problem with these people. I have black friends. You know, <laughs> they don't realize that there are certain things that are ingrained, you know, just through society, what we see, what we've grown up with, the ideas that we've heard, things that we see on the TV, the news, the media. Like, it becomes ingrained in you whether you realize it or not. So you can be the sweetest, you know, most wholesome person, love everybody, and you can still do something racist or have racist tendencies or not be able to acknowledge um, racism in front of you. The same way people can't acknowledge that they have privilege, you know, it's it's all a part of one thing. So these people, I think some people just be lying and saying they it's not racist, <laughs> you know, it's not racism. They just lying, they just denying it. But some people genuinely don't see it. They don't think that that's the case. Um, you know, I read uh, an article the other day that was in the Hollywood Reporter, and it was. Uh, anonymous, different comments from people from within the Academy who voted, you know, for the awards. And one person said why he didn't, or I'm assuming it was a he, but I don't know, this person, why they did not vote for Get Out. And one of the comments they made was that they felt like um, they said it was entertaining and they did a great job, but it wasn't Oscar worthy. And they said that uh, they felt like the movie played the race card. Um, and <laughs> the same person also brought up the fact that Daniel Kaluuya is uh, American. And, you know, they thought that using his comment on American issues was just a way to play the race card. Now, that's like, <laughs> to me, that's so foolish. And it's so you didn't pay attention to the movie. This person also, you know, this like it was entertaining, but they didn't think that there was anything realistic about it. They didn't think it was anything, you know, whatever. So they missed the whole point, but all, but then on top of missing the point, they needed to go and dig with the race card comment. See, that's a completely unnecessary comment, right? So to me, when a person makes a comment like that, I want to shout your racism is showing. Your yeah. privilege is showing. Yep, yep, you know yep. what I mean? Because, that's unnecessary. You could think it was entertaining. You could think like, I don't, you could even say, I don't think this is real. You know, you could say like, this seems a little exaggerated to me. I don't think this is an issue. But when you minimize it, uh, when you listen to what your friend is saying, to what someone is saying, it's like, if I came to you right now was like, Hey, I was just outside at X, Y, Z happened to me. And you said, no, <laughs> like, what do you mean? It, I'm telling you, this thing just happened and you're saying no not only are you, you're not just saying well that sounds crazy that sounds absurd are you sure ask me questions you're just straight up saying i think that you're being dramatic you know um, i i it, man it's so hard to like it's so hard to separate these two topics and i wanted i wanted to end with black panther but like mm-hmm. the, the that has what what you just uh explained has been probably the most frustrating frustrated I have been uh throughout like this moment of going into Black Panther cuz I'll tell you like straight um that I I didn't have a certain I didn't have an excitement for Black Panther up until I cuz it was just a movie a comic book movie I I get like the at that moment I got like the fun about it, but it wasn't until Mm -hmm. I was, um, I was shopping or Christmas shopping for my, no, I wasn't Christmas. I was just looking for toys for my son and I saw a black Panther toy and on that black Panther toy, it was a black kid playing with the toy and there was no other white kid on the box. And usually these are like, those are the kind of moments where these companies fuck up like real big, and and not understand like yo you this is you just had a tone deaf moment where we had black panther Mm -hmm. and you put that black panther toy on a white kid so like it was that moment where i realized yo this is like this is some serious like this is some real shit that's about to happen like like um like you've been um posting things on representation matters and like that was a moment where i really realized like 
this is not just another movie. You know, I mean, it's easy for me to ignore it because I see enough movies and I don't really get caught into I try to not have to lean into any of the racial stuff if I don't have to. I mean, I'll make a commentary on shit that I don't, that, that it, it sparks my interest, but in general, it's nothing that I try to carry with me, even though I know it's there. Um, mm-hmm. um, okay, you, you hit me with a sidebar I wasn't ready for. <laughs> no, my bad. <laughs> um, but, uh, what am I trying to get to? Uh, I, I'm gonna touch that racial part here in one second. But we, um, I just did this episode about the gun, um, the gun debate, and I, it was a comment that, a back and forth that was made that was about, you know, I said it's more reasonable for a black person raised a certain way from a certain environment to have a gun for safety than someone, than white people, essentially, and the rebuttal to is like, you know, that's kind of subjective because what if that person thinks that they should have a gun for some impending threat and the police that are coming to get Chanel, but whatever. Um, but uh, that what if they think it's reasonable, more reasonable for them to have a gun than you? And my argument was like, there is more historical context that show that I should probably be be the one to arm myself because white not only do black people you know black on black crime and i'm raised where i'm raised but there are white people that are put, was pulling niggas out of houses and hanging them and doing all this sort of thing like there is more crime against me and if you can't see that that there's history that would lend it be to be more reasonable that black people have guns or black people need guns for protection then i would have to argue that that you're racist because apparently i don't see how you're incapable of seeing that or seeing your privilege or seeing that we have more fear and more targets on our life than 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 most white people do so you know just inherently just being here just just existing just going outside just you know, driving around and whatever. Like, we have more of that against us. My old man would call me while I'm in the middle of a point. Um, We have more of these things happen against us. And if you can't see that, then you would be racist. And I feel the same way about these movies now at a, at a point when we're giving you multifaceted layering on top of layers to show you our culture. And you say, oh, this is too dramatic or this isn't realistic. It's like, yo, we are, we made this. <laughs> like, no, it wasn't right. a white director. It wasn't like we're trying to give you this, present to you what we go through. And you're telling me, nah, y'all bullshit. And if you do that to me, right. you're racist. Like, or you don't know your racial bias, but you are. Because you're not even, you're, right. you're downplaying it. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I think, you know, that all stems from the belief that, um, you know, we are being dramatic and that a lot of people have had trouble in life and they should, they have managed to raise above it and so should we and blah, 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 blah. I think people also forget how recent all of these things were. You know, people forget that slavery didn't end that long ago. Jim Crow didn't end that long ago. Segregation didn't end that long ago. Um, black people just got were able to vote pretty recently. You know, there's it's only like about two generations back. Martin Luther King would still be alive today. Could still be alive today. Right. You know, I mean, my grandmother lived during segregation. And my grandma's, I don't have an old grandmother, you know, I mean, she's, she's not, she's not 80 something years old, you know what I mean? And she, um, lived during segregation. So it wasn't that long ago. And I think people forget that. Uh, I think that we were sold the idea, I would say in the nineties, we were sold this idea of post-racial America and it's not true. It never really existed. Um, race has always been a factor and it's, been evident time and time again however it is always justified away and the reason it's always justified away is because the people who are in power are not the people who are being affected the people who are in power are the same people who are committing the crime so they're able to justify they it's you know it's a boys club you know Mm. so they 
they're able they protect their own and you know people say well you well black people need to band together and protect their own and build up their own communities and do what asian people did and do what black latino people did and do what white people did the difference is that black people have never they didn't get the chance to come here freely right Mm. with the option of trying to build something up they didn't come here in groups and say let's better ourselves together they were brought here against their will, and they were not counted as human. Asian people, Latin people, they've had their struggles. Don't get me wrong. Asian people were put into concentration camps. Um, you know, obviously, right now we try to build a wall with Mex- between Mexico. So they have their issues. However, they've always been counted as human, Full not always citizens, but as human. Full and I think humans. that is a big thing. Yes, that's a, that's a big difference. Um, you know, they were coming to this country freely while Africans and black people were still uh, slaves, were still sharecroppers, were still experiencing segregation. Latinos and Asians were coming here freely at that same time. So that's why it's different. Um, so, but people, but you know, people want to ignore that or skew the facts or whatever. Now, the other thing about guns and about you know, who should have guns and who should, who's under more danger and who's not. The, the problem is that extreme um, white radicals, white uh, nationalists, all these things, they believe, their belief system is rooted in the idea that they think that they're going to go extinct. They are afraid. Their whole thing is rooted in fear. Now, yeah. whether it's a logical fear or not, that doesn't matter. They are deathly afraid that they are going to go extinct. So, to them, that fear is very real that they need to have these guns because there's some unknown danger, right, that wants to attack them. I see it all the time online saying that the white man is the most persecuted uh, <laughs> person in America right now. And it's like, Man, really? That's how you really believe this. You truly I, believe this. And this. We 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 brought it up. I mean, in, in that episode, uh, where you uh, you mentioned that it's fear, and maybe it is a fear and extinction, and it's also a reason why I uh, one of the things I want to make sure we did in that episode put everything on the table, but um, mm-hmm. from mental illness, because I also argue what you said to me. Is mental illness. Now, that's a it's a loose version of that of that thing, and that's why I don't like playing the mental illness game when it comes to gun rights and things like that because it is a fear, and it is a fear of everything else. Uh, I, I I guess the extinction extinction argument works. I've always said they fear anything that's not. It's a we. I I bring it down to white male complex is that they right. want to be the more most powerful they 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 just everything that goes with that uh, and I don't want to re rehash the uh, same argument but they want everything that comes with that is like no I don't want the black man to come do this I don't want the Mexican to come do that and the, the Asian to do that and the natives to do that it's like their fear is something being taken from them. Or I guess that extinction. I never really thought about the extinction part, but I wonder how much of some of this stuff has an uptick when you start hearing reports in the what early two thousands that after so long the white people will now be the new minority. You know, so right. It's an interesting state, uh, well, take on that. Yeah, well, I was gonna say I saw this article. It was floating around a few years ago that was um, predicting what people will look like in, I don't know what year, like 2047 or whatever year. Um, and pretty much everyone was some shade of brown. They don't look like Chanel. Some sort of <laughs> way- <laughs> Everybody don't look like you. curly hair. Or- right. So, <laughs> um, but here's the, the funny thing to me is that white people have always been the minority, like, in the world. I mean... <laughs> If you if think about it, really everybody is the minority. If like it's white people versus everybody, white people the minority. If it's black people versus everybody, you're always a minority in some form. Right. So I still- just feel like 
you know, I think that there's two things at play. When I say that they're afraid of extinction, I'm speaking of the really extreme groups. You know, that's literally what they say, like these um, KKK, KKK and nationalists and all these people. They say that. Um, I think your everyday person who's not actually aligned with that, who seems to snap or who does something crazy, who goes on a racist rant, who, you know, shoots up something or whatever. I think those people, for them, it is a power struggle. And it comes from the fact that they were told, you know, white men in particular have been taught, uh, whether directly or indirectly, that they are supposed to be in power, right? They're supposed to have the power. So when they feel like they don't have the power, because if you notice, it's not usually, it's not rich white men that are going on these shooting sprees or going on these random rants in grocery stores. These are people who feel threatened. Their power feels threatened because they are white men and they don't have the power that they have been promised their whole lives. Because it's repeated. I mean, we all have heard this narrative that the white man has all the power and is the person who runs everything, who runs companies, who runs government, who runs, you know, everything, who makes all the decisions. So when you're a poor white man or you're a white man who's been working hard and now someone is coming and taking your job or you're a white man who's a little awkward and people don't want to be your friends and girls don't want to date you, it's a power struggle. It's a power thing. Because the same thing happens, you know, these these kids or not even kids, they're adults, but these people who go and shoot places or bomb places or whatever, a lot of times you see that they've been into fringe activity and they, you know, they need to find something that gives them a meaning. They want to go down in infamy. They want people to pay attention to them. Um, they were always weird. They were always loners. They were always whatever. And I think, and I don't think that that's an excuse, because I hate when the media is always like, well, he was a, a lonely boy. I thought, like, okay, yeah. whatever. The fact is that they don't have coping skills, and the, that combined with feeling, uh, feeling like you have a right to this power, that is the recipe for disaster. You know, because they not do, they're not any worse off than some minority kid who ain't have, don't have nothing and who nobody's paying attention to or listening to. But you know why the minority kid ain't going and blowing shit up? Because they don't think that they're supposed to have it. And that's, and I'm, Man, I'm you know, I'm, I'm of shit. course, I'm, yeah, I'm boiling it down. You know, I'm making it very oversimplified. That's what I think that is the underlying thing. The truth is, no matter how confident, you know, uh, you see these black kids in the in the hood. You know they seem confident. They seem whatever. They seem like oh, this is they don't want nothing better than where they are. You know we always talk about how come these people don't want better than what they have. It's not that they don't want better than what they have. It's that they don't think they can get better. They don't know better. They don't believe that they can actually achieve better. Whereas these white kids, they think I'm white. I was told I was supposed to have this. And and then on top of that, I'm being fed. The media is telling me that white men are in power. And then people around me in my little, you know, town are telling me that the reason that we are where we are is because the Mexicans and the blacks and the this and the that came. The reason these girls don't like me is because they bitches. The reason that the teacher is giving me bad grades is because the teacher is an asshole. It's all everybody else's fault. It's not theirs. But minorities take the fault onto themselves because so they've been told that they suck. They've been told that they're stupid. They've been told that they're dumb. They're ghetto. They're ugly. So they take it on. This uh. Ian. Yeah, this <laughs> this is this is gonna be a a bad segue, but uh. <laughs> after that, because I'm 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 gonna let you have the last word on that on that on the gun thing, um, the racial thing, obviously with the topics that. I pick for today's show. Um, it's gonna play out. It's gonna play out the whole show. So, get ready. Um, All right. <laughs> uh, so, I was trying to. I, as you was telling us, I was like, man, do I just need to jump into it or go to something else? I'm. I'm still. I'm committed to saving Black Panther to end the show. So even though oh, like man. this Get Out and Black Panther kind of wedge itself together. Uh, so and it's so much anecdotal shit. I want to add. I know, like, I don't want to not end with Black Panther because I want to end with a certain song, and I'm gonna keep it at the end. Um, <laughs> so hard segue, hard change. Monique, 
uh, I think some of this plays into like some of this conversation, and I think some of this goes with, you know, uh, here we'll just jump into it. So Monique mm -hmm. um, is upset about a her net a. Uh, uh, a deal that she wanted to make to put out a Netflix special, uh, a special on Netflix. Um, and she was offered what it was like half a million dollars or something like that, um, that she didn't want, uh, that she felt like she was being under that price undervalued her or, or it just was insulting to, uh, what her comedic legend is. And it doesn't equate to the deals that were made by other comedians such as, Amy Schumer, if you don't know her, she's white. Uh, she had a pretty good year with a couple movie or several movies, as well as her uh, version of the Chappelle show called the Amy Schumer show on Comedy Central. And uh, as well as the deals made with uh, um, Dave Chappelle and was it Chris Rock? Was Chris Rock one? Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. she didn't feel like her deal measured up to the deals that they was being offered. And so she's kind of been on a media tour uh, expressing her feelings about that and saying that it was uh, also a, a gender and racial bias that is the reason why she isn't getting that deal um, or getting the money that she feels that she deserves or the reason why Netflix pretty much lowballed her as well as some issues that came with some supposed blackballing that she got within the entertainment industry. So, um, I don't even know how to start this. I'll start my opinion. I think Monique got her goddamn mind. That's my, this I, <laughs> my opinion. Like I, I respect, I, I, I personally am not a fan of Monique's, um, comedy, but that has nothing to do with, you know, if she has an audience, she has an audience. So if people want, like, I'm not a big fan of Cat Williams' work, but he has an audience that people pay for. So they ain't got, I don't think that has a lot to do with, um, well, I guess it should have, it, it does have something to do with the deal that you are offered. But I think she got, she got a bullshit offer. But I kind of feel <laughs> like, if the blackballing thing is true, and because I don't check for Monique, I, I couldn't, I, I have no idea. Um, I kind of feel like if you're trying to climb your way back up, you kind of got to take a few shitty deals just to, just to show, like, hey, I'm here. I'm still here. We're going to make this work, but I got to get back in the game. Is that, what do you think? Okay. I know it's hard to unfold. Here's the thing. So, yeah, when you get back blacklisted, blackballed, whatever, you have to, you know, re-establish yourself. And I think that, to Monique's credit, um, before this, Netflix deal went uh, went awry. <laughs> she did put out a movie um, that did very well um, for that for that movie for the budget. You know, it did well. What what movie? Um, Do you know? Remember the name or whatever? Something Christmas. Okay. All, all right. I'm, I before know Christmas. It was a Christmas after movie. Christmas, after almost, Christmas. Almost almost Christmas. Almost Christmas. Almost Christmas. Let me. See. I'm um, my Google machine work here. It did really. It did really well. Like it was made for. Uh, I want to say it grossed somewhere between twenty five and thirty million more than what it was made for. I, I'm. I could be wrong on those numbers, but it made much more than it. Uh, the budget it was much more than it was made for. Budget was seventeen million. Box office forty two. Okay, so those are good numbers. So, um, you know, she's been doing her thing and from what i hear what i understand is she's been trying to do stuff for a while but she hasn't been able to book anything for whatever reason i don't know you know there's different stories why she can't book down that's nothing neither here nor there but she booked this movie right before this whole netflix thing also to her credit i don't know about her fan base i'm not a fan or, or not i'm not i don't like her or dislike her you know 
if I see her, I'm like, oh, cool, that's entertaining, but I don't necessarily go out looking for her. Um, but I actually was talking about Monique a week before that viral video where she was saying, boycott Netflix. Literally, the like, maybe even less than a week <laughs> before I was talking about her. And I was saying, man, it's such a shame that, like, you know, she hasn't been in anything for a while. She was at the Academy Awards, and then she got blackballed. And I was talking about that whole ordeal and saying, well, she says X, Y, Z happened, and that's why she got blackballed, but I don't know. I wonder where she is. I wonder if she'll do something soon. And then lo and behold, <laughs> a few days later, here she is on my Facebook on this video talking about boycott Netflix. <sighs> so it puts you in a precarious position. But I was, but me saying, my point of saying that is, do people want something from her? I would say yes, because if myself, if I'm not someone who would label myself a Monique fan, and I was literally checking for a week before, then I think people who are her fans, who really are like Team Monique, probably have been wanting stuff from her too. And the fact of the matter is, she has been very successful throughout the year. So she does have a strong fan base, I'm sure. Um, I'm not a part of it, so I don't know, but I'm assuming she does. The deal from Netflix, what they offered her was way ridiculous. But ridiculous I overall think, or ridiculous for the price? I think it was too low. I think it was too low for someone with her resume. Even if she hasn't, you know, even if it's not current, you know, it hasn't been that long. It's not like it's been 30 years since we've seen her. You know what I mean? Like, I felt like that price was very, very low. Um, I think the issue, and I think where she messed up a little bit, is the way, it, it, you know, you can be speaking truth all day long, but it's the way that you deliver the message that's going to get it heard or not heard. The preacher standing on the corner with a bullhorn, don't nobody listen to him because they think he's crazy. So I think there's something about that. So her, you know, saying, when she started saying she's the most decorated uh, comedian and when she started comparing herself to Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle, um, I think that's where she lost people. I understand what she was trying to say, and I think her point was simply that if you're giving these type of budgets for comedy specials, then what you're offering me is so much lower than that. It's not, you know, it's one percent of that, and that's absurd. Which that is a good point. That's a valid point. Is it? Um, but because yeah, I, it I, is. I look at it. I, I guess because I don't, I don't know what kind of typical deals are given. Like when you say when you say Chris Rock. You say, um, Dave Chappelle. This is like forget legends. These are lowercase G gods. Of course. Uh, and it's like you can't, you can't, you can't even just decide that I'm going to put myself in that category. Of uh, course, for sure. And I think I'm sorry. <laughs> no, what I, what I'm saying is like, like, all right, if they get, if they get, I tell you. If you tell me, not only because look at what also what Dave Chappelle did. Dave Chappelle didn't just put out a special. He said, "I'm gonna give y'all a bag of specials because I I do this. It don't fucking matter. I give you four or five of these motherfuckers. You want six? I give you ten. Like whatever bag they gave him and for what he turned around, I'm pretty sure people ran to Netflix and was like, "Oh shit!" Like you ain't gonna see Dave Chappelle come up on your Netflix and really be like, "Oh, I'm gonna watch that this weekend." You damn near want to watch it now. You watch it this weekend because you just like, I I, I just want to have a good weekend. But like, mm -hmm. and, and I think the same with Rock. Now I didn't watch Chris Rock's uh, one because I heard some bad reviews. I probably still eventually watch it. I never been the biggest Chris Rock fan. But I'm still probably watch it. But you, you say on a weekend, I'm going to line my comedy night up. I don't know where Monique would just fall into, like, place there. Right. Even um, even if we go, if we go, if we just go two of the, uh, um, I'm willing to bet, personally, if Whoopi Goldberg, Wanda Sykes, Monique, Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, well, all dropped a special every day for one week. Each one of them had their own day. I don't even think people go run, rush to that Monique one like everything else. I think that it's not a matter legends. of if she should. 
be paid the same or if she's a legend or I mean she was saying all that that's not my argument because I you know that's a whole different thing uh-huh. that's her I don't even know what that's it but I do think that what she was offered was still ridiculous because if you're offering 20 million uh to Dave Chappelle and I'm not sure how much Chris Rock got but let's say he's 20 million as well and Amy Schumer is getting 13 they offered Monique 500,000 like that's such a tiny 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 percentage (laughs) of what they're giving and not that she needs to get 20 million but She's also not a brand new comic. You see what I'm saying? What's a and good number? What's a good number for for? for I don't her? know because that's not my world. You know that I'm gonna be real. That's not my world. I'm not in comedy. I, and you know what? I think what it I is. I don't know. What bothers me is that she put other people. She put us in other people's pocket because she felt like her pocket right. wasn't right. Because it's like I don't. I don't necessarily care what any of these. I mean that. Any of them are getting paid, but when you right. when you do it and the way that she's doing it, when you're comparing it to like, I think it was, I understand her maybe going back and forth with the Amy Schumer part, but when you add like mm-hmm. comedy gods to it, it's like now you make people start to disagree with you when you make the arg- the argument that she's making either from the gender or racial point. Because I think she has a better right. argument against Amy Schumer, but I would still argue like Amy Schumer got her deal off of a phenomenal couple year run for her, and she had this crazy following. Who I think they probably gambled with with Amy Schumer in a way that they wasn't willing to gamble with Monique. Right, and I think that because um, I think know, they lost money with what Amy you're Schumer. saying. They did lose, uh, did not do well, very well at all, but. <laughs> what you're saying is exactly my point of, um, you know, it's not necessarily the message is how it's delivered. So she wanted to make a point about race and gender in, uh, inequality, but the way that she went about it caused a, a ruffling of feathers in, a, in the way that was not intended. You know what I mean? Because like you said, now she got people in other folks' pockets. And that's not even, I don't think that was the point of what she was trying to say or has been trying to say because she's going on this rant about equality um but i think she just went about it the wrong way by mentioning these names and then she does the whole little bit further when she says she's the most decorated female black female comedian i just wonder what that alive she's never explained that and i kind of want to know that (laughs) i mean because i i think you know, she, she does Precious, and, I mean, did great, but that wasn't comedy, right. so that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to give you a comedy bag. Um, everything everything comedy-wise that she named, and and uh, for the audience, we're referencing some of the things said during the Breakfast Club interview, but when she mentioned, like, her, some of the things she's done that made xyz it was all ensemble stuff like even i just looked up this uh almost christmas and right when i look at this i'm seeing danny glover i'm seeing gabrielle union monique jb smooth omar epps like a lot of people that people would go tune in just to see their favorite person in there than Mm -hmm. necessarily for monique when i look at queens of comedy i see an all-star cast of other comedian women that I think, I mean, just like the Kings are coming, like, you came for the person you came to see, and then it was just a moment. I mean, I'm not going to act like that wasn't a moment. That was a moment that was created, but if you ask me to compare you to Amy Schumer, who was out there on her own, and Chappelle, who's out there on her own, and, like, on his own, and Rock. I I even hate, even in this conversation, keep mentioning Chappelle and Rock, because they're just two different entities in it like they're two different things in this industry or in the in that world like they 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 know for a fact if i don't have another if i ain't in another movie i'm gonna sell some comedy tickets and i don't Mm -hmm. know that monique necessarily has that and i think a deal here we'll just get beyond the deal i kind of feel like if what she feels about herself is true i don't know why you can't just do it independent like Louis C.K. did and made 
whatever he made off of naming your own price. He let his audience name his own their own price, and he was able to make millions of dollars. Right. I you know. I don't have nothing. I, there's nothing I can <laughs> even say about the rant that she's been on and the, I don't want to say rant. That's a bad word. That makes it sound like the, whatever the mission she's been on. Um, and this Netflix thing, I think um, I really, you know, I watched the breakfast club thing and, uh, I want to say that her purpose is something different, but that Netflix, situation got her mad that's what she came at us with mm. but i think that as i was listening to her more i was seeing that that's not necessarily the full scope of her point and her mission however that's what people are talking about because unfortunately she or fortunately however you want to look at it she made a viral video yeah. where she was basically ranting and telling people calling people to action when, first off, nobody knew it came out of the blue. You know what I'm saying? It would have been different if she had been kind of like having these videos talking about what's been happening to her and da 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 And then she had a call to action. But it was just like, hey, here I am. You haven't seen me in a minute. Here's a call to action. And I think that is what, unfortunately, that's what people are talking about. But the bigger scope of what she's saying of, um, you know, noticing things that are not right and speaking up or saying, hey, I don't like this or don't talk to this person that way, don't talk to me this way, don't do this, don't do X, Y, Z, has gotten her labeled as a bully or difficult to work with or whatever. And whether that's the case or not, um, she's still bringing up valid points about like speaking up when something wrong is happening or something you disagree with is happening. Uh, now, now, here's the thing. But I there's gotta... also... Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and finish your point. I was going to say, but then there's also the business side of it. And there's a way to speak up and to get things done and accomplished without just ruffling feathers. You know what I mean? There's like, you got to be tactical about it. Now, here's my question to you. And, and I, I can only ask this because I'm not a woman. I don't know what this is like. Um, this is a real serious question. So I, I would like you to take this seriously. Um, are you calling your boyfriend daddy? I mean, I just, <laughs> I just, I'm just curious if we're in the professional moment here and we're trying to take things seriously, how often are you just going to be calling your manager slash husband daddy the whole time? <laughs> in a professional setting. Yeah. In an interview. I, you know, I'm okay. trying to take it seriously. <laughs> it's just like, go ahead and talk daddy. I'm like, hold on. I, Is this 73? Yeah, <laughs> no, again, it's the, the the message and the messenger. You know what I mean? It's like when you do things like that, then people going to be like, what are you talking about? And she, because I, you know, I had questions about that too. And I had seen that she had explained that somewhere. So I looked that up and got her reasoning for why she calls him daddy. I don't necessarily agree with it. Hey, you gonna have to enlighten us because I don't know why. <laughs> I okay. mean, if that's they, if they stay relationship cool, but you just can't be out here. Come on, daddy. Right. I mean, okay. So this is her reasoning that she said. She said that she said because I don't even feel right saying the phrase. It sounds so wrong. She said because he is raising her. And I think what she means is raising her up, making her a better person, Hold improving on. her, taking her to the next lesson. I but wait, I'm going to tell you the rest okay, of the thing. I'm going to tell you the rest. I'll tell you why I say that. Because she said, he is raising me. And she said, you know, there's plenty of people out there who would have been called in efforts, who would have been cussed out, who would have been this, that, this, and the third. I would have been out here. If I didn't have this man guiding me, I would have been out here doing you know, any type of projects and going off on people and, you know, all this stuff. So she continued to basically explain how without him in her life, guiding her and encouraging her and lifting her, raising her, I suppose, um, that she would be doing, either she would be a worse person or she would be making worse decisions. And that what their relationship is, is true love and it is true you know, growth and raising her up and 
people don't understand it because they never saw their mama be loved by a man. This is literal. This is what Monique said. Y'all don't get that because you never saw your mama be loved. So of course this is weird to you. Mm. Okay. Mm. So there's a lot in that. There's yeah, a lot to unpack a lot. in that. But but well, let's just pull out a shirt. Uh, so <laughs> th- that that actually kind of explains some of what I feel about what I saw in that interview, because uh-huh. I feel like she has a battery in her back, and one of the moments, and what I mean by that is like some something else other than herself is charging her up in this moment, because, um. Um, hold on. I got to mute something. There we go. Uh, and I say that because at the end of this interview, he says, if you want to know how anyone feels, blah, 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 ask Paul Mooney. And Paul Mooney is probably one of the most controversial comics because he puts a lot on the racial aspects of things. And Mm -hmm. that's a very specific person and comedy legend or comedy at least comedy legend writer um in that industry but to point to him and then what i hear what monique said because monique never mentions paul mooney i feel like a lot of what she said is gassed by her manager slash husband and i think that if this is really how he feels uh, about this is because what he mentioned before like we leaving a millions of dollars on the table and for me i think shit uh i'll just write something for netflix and go on the road with some new shit like y- if you leave it mm-hmm. millions of dollars on the table i'm not I'm half a million okay fuck y'all we'll wait for you to call me back and then we'll do the deal that i want to make then that's how i look at that but to go on this mm-hmm. run and i said on my facebook earlier like if she go on this whole run and there's no receipts at the end of this, like, this is almost, this doesn't help that black ball thing because it's showing that you'll go out here and, and, and shoot everybody in the head and then get nothing out of it. You're not going to get an right. H, especially if you're not going to run that deal independent. So, to me, if she go does this run and daddy is out here helping her do this run, that's a piss poor ass manager. That's my opinion. You ain't got to say that. That's a piss poor ass manager because he's 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 putting her out here for the wolves. The wolves meaning the internet and social media and everybody else who may or may not turn their back on her, and then gonna end this whole run when everyone forgets about it and have not a special for us to go watch or a show for us to watch or anything that creates value for that brand. Also, they can go out here and just say Netflix is racist or Netflix has gender, gender bias. Because what happens when the next deal she gets, HBO comes up and they want to give her $1.5 million, but they just gave, I don't know, somebody that she don't think is good enough, $18 million. Now you're going to shit on HBO? You just shit on the two biggest platforms for comedians. Yeah, but see, well, first of all, $1.5 million and $500K is a big difference. <laughs> You know, that's, Fair enough, that's a huge difference. But it's uh, still a sizable uh, difference between the complaint that she's making is that they gave Amy Schumer 10 plus million. They gave these other people 10 plus million. You're still looking at 10% of what these other people were getting. Right, but I don't think that it's fair to assume that she wouldn't have taken 1.5. I think that what I'm understanding is that the the initial offer was such a slap in the face and they brought up these other people and said, you know, we know that you can offer more and this what you offer is ridiculous considering X, Y, Z. And Netflix said, okay, we will go think on what you're saying. And then Netflix uh, declined to come back with a counter. That's what I'm understood. That's what I understood from the interview. It, do you um, think got, that da- I, Daddy? Uh, <laughs> you think Daddy negotiates or Monique negotiates the deal? Well, I was gonna say I got that understanding from the interview, but I gathered that understanding from 
daddy for what he was saying. So I say that to say that if you li- if you watch the interview and you listen to the way that he speaks and the way that she speaks, she didn't sound off the handle. Mm. Whether or not you agreed with his points or 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 whatever, he listened to what was being said. He acknowledged what was being said, and then he rebuttaled what was being said. Um, in a business-like manner, as opposed to Monique, who was emotional and who was, I hate to say this, but it was a little bit of ego-driven. Um, and, and again, I'm going to keep saying the message over the messenger, you know? Mm. So her message is getting lost in the delivery. Because I think that if you were to just, I will be curious to see or hear an interview with just Tim. Because he seemed to be speaking logically. Now, with that in mind, of course, I don't know. I agree with you that, you know, he's pushing her and he's guiding her and he's supposed to be the manager. So you got to question the person that's, a, you know, who's steering the ship. But I also, now when you put that into context with what she said about how he is raising her and keeping her from being absolutely ridiculous, then it makes sense. It all makes sense then. And then you think, oh, well, who did this video? Now, mind you, he let her post it, and he let her go on the air by herself without him in the room. But still, and then you to start thinking, like, is this toned down, Monique? Mm. Or, <laughs> you know what I mean? Is this Monique after she's been worked on, worked with? Mm. Now, and, w- with, with the Monique situation, though, uh, I think it – uh, you can't really ignore the 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 argument that she's making um, in general, mm-hmm. and it made me uh, as this was happening. I was reading comments the uh, for one side or another on this. It made me think about like like black women in entertainment and the renaissance i feel like i mean we talk about black renaissance but really black women have really kind of kicked shit up like kind of took the reins and just been running with it the past year and right i wonder like there's no doubt that what she's saying is 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 has some merit in the big picture that these uh uh that there are some gender biases and racial bias, and it's so much hard. I mean, it can be, and I I, I don't know, but that it, it, harder for black women in the entertainment business. But with uh-huh. this res- this surgence that has been happening, does that are these two separate two separate things, or in terms of Monique versus what's happening that we see? Or are these things married it together? Um, her experience and just her what she's out here marching for, and what we're seeing happening with so many of these black actors and directors and 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 I mean TV shows and things like that 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 have black women as lead like, that's running the show or as lead actors and actresses, so actors and actresses. But. Right. Well, I think what's important about the people that we are seeing, these black women we are seeing rising up now, is that they have been doing a lot of this, this stuff themselves. They've been hustling and they've been unapologetically black women. And I think that that is how they've been able to get to where they are. Um, and I'll, you know, I think it took as long as it did because people didn't want to have to do that. You know what I mean? Like you don't want to have to create your own playing field when there's a playing field right there. Like that sucks. Yeah. And when there's a park and you want to go to the park, it's right here. Nobody's on the field. It's room for you, but you're being told that you cannot come into play. You got to go make your own thing from scratch. You really only want to do this one thing, but now you got to learn how to write. You got to learn how to direct. You got to learn how to be a businesswoman. You got to do all this stuff, be a producer. You have to do all of that just to do the one thing that you wanted to do, which was acting or comedy or whatever. And I think that, um, cause myself, I've struggled with that, you know, people, Oh, well you should write something for yourself. And I've been like, Hey, I'm not trying to be a writer though. Like, Mm -hmm. there's plenty of writers out here. That wasn't what I signed up for. It's already some writers. I wanted to be the actor. But, you know, these people that we're seeing who are 
making amazing work and winning these awards now and are, are on all the red carpets and all the magazines, they did it themselves. They had to make their own playing field. And I think it is connected because that is indicative of what she's saying. You know, because it's been so biased, so unfair, um, they've had to make their own stuff. You know, nobody was telling our stories. Our stories mean black women. Nobody was telling our story. So we had to tell them ourselves. Um, and, you know, you see people like Lena Waithe, who uh, is winning these awards, and she's a voice because she's telling her story as a black lesbian woman. And nobody was telling that story. And she did it herself. You know what I mean? Um, Issa Rae, nobody was telling that story. So it is connected, I think, because it's kind of like you don't have options. I mean, even you just said, uh, well, if Netflix isn't giving her a deal, I'd say do it yourself. <laughs> you know, you said that. They said it in the Breakfast Club because that has become, you know, the answer. You have to do it yourself. And so to, while I say, yeah, do it yourself, I can also see why that's frustrating because it's like, damn, why I got to I gotta go out here and build a whole country before I can <laughs> see any benefit? You know, like I got to go do all that. Why? I shouldn't have to if we're all supposed to be a part of the same industry and the structure already exists. I should be able to play with the, with everyone else. Well, um, I also look at it. I mean, yes, I guess it comes in. And and it depends on how you're willing to look at innovating the platform, I right. guess. Because in the same way that we go, like some people, I guess some people want to be the thing that they want to be versus some people wanting to build these empires. Because uh, we talked before about like people like Kevin Hart, who, you know, just like kind of have leveraged all these things into like, this is all me and I'm able to build this platform in a way. And I'll produce the show, mm -hmm. I'll do this, I'll do all that because it don't do nothing. I get to make the I get to make the thing that I want to make versus make the thing that someone else wants me to make or make something and then have someone chop it up and it not be and it lose the integrity that mm -hmm. I originally planned for. So in ways Oh, was it a a natural place that like like Louis C.K. for one? Louis C.K. has always produced his own stuff, and he's always benefited from it. And it's kind of like being an independent artist. If you're an independent artist and you sell fifty thousand records, you potentially make more money than a major artist who sells a million records, or you're at least in the same pocket, and you didn't have to outperform the record sales whereas monique is sound like all right i want all this stuff to happen for me up front so i don't have to hustle i don't have to go out there and push 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 hard for every dollar versus you have these uh people who are Issa Rae's who created her own who started with the youtube thing building her own thing and now it's like people will come to her to say hey we want to make a deal with you what do you want to do? You know, she's built, right. it, and it seems like that was just a natural progression and a place that we should, I, I, I hear what you're saying, because you're right, I, like, the, I the, think, go ahead. I was going to say, I think it has to do with your vision and your goal for some people. You know, like you said, like some people, like Kevin Hart, for example, I think Kevin Hart always had a vision in his head of what he wanted to be. You know what I mean? And there was no path for that. So he had to create that path. Um, and I think that's a little bit different from what's happening for black women, where there is a path, but we're not allowed to walk on it. We got to take the alternate route. You know, mm. uh, I think that's the difference. Because he, he wanted to do something completely different. You know, he has branded himself as a, com a comedy rock star. That's a whole different thing. That's something that there was no, that, that wasn't a thing. His goal, you know, when you watch his specials, his goal was to sell out Madison Square Garden because he hadn't seen other comedians do that. And so he wanted to do, that was his goal. That was his vision. It's something that hadn't happened. It didn't exist. So he had to build a whole path to get there. 
right? So it it has to do with what what is your vision and what is your goal. Now for black women, and the reason that yes, it is it can be tough to be a black woman in entertainment is because there is a road. <laughs> there is a road. You know what I mean? Like Issa Rae, she was making something to tell her story, and her story wasn't being told, so she had to create the road. You see what I'm saying? As opposed to someone like Monique who wants to do a comedy special. There is a road for comedy special. There's all that already exists. So her frustration comes from why can't I walk down this road that exists already? And and then the other part of it, the other side of it that some people are affected by is ego. You know, because I'll admit, when people way back was telling me to write, and the thing is, I'm a, I write. When people were initially telling me to write while I was trying to act, I was like, man, I'm trying to act. Why are you going to tell me to write? You know what I mean? It's like yeah. if you're doing your job and somebody comes in and says, oh, you should go do that. You know, you over here uh, creating <laughs> art and someone tells you <laughs> you should do poetry. You know, you're like, yeah. what the hell? Like, I'm over here trying to create a masterpiece and now you're telling me that I will be better off doing this thing? Like, it's like a slap in the face. But I had to, I will admit that that was a little bit of ego, you know, Um because I wasn't seeing the bigger picture. And, and it wasn't until I started to realize that I was frustrated because stories weren't being told that I thought I wanted to tell, that I realized, aha, that's why we need to do X, Y, Z. That's why representation matters, because these stories aren't being told, because I'm being put, I'm constantly going to auditions where I'm the only Black person. You know, I'm auditioning for white roles. Why? Because there's no role for me mm. that's written. You know, so. Why well, do you think it, it that's a? a uh, you think that's a a race? Ah, it, it is a racial issue. So I don't want to like I don't want to say the obvious. Uh, mm-hmm. but is it? Do you think it's faith in the part or faith in the audience? Like, and what I mean by that is, is um, and we're slowly creeping and knocking on the door of the subject, but. Like, sometimes I wonder if things don't get made because they don't believe the people will go see it. Versus, like, they probably want to make it, but because it's so much money at <sighs> risk, do we do they really want to take the risk of supporting something, losing a you. bunch of money because the audience won't show up? <sighs> I got so much to say on that. I think that is a BS excuse that we have been fed now yes there are some things out there that people want to get made that are trash that are not going to pull in no money that's true that's fair however every time we hear that reasoning given well we don't know if people will come see it we don't know if we'll make our money back we don't you know it usually has to do with race or with gender or basically any sort of minority being the lead or the writer or the director or whatever and I think that that is biased because it has been proven time and time again that these movies will gross. It's been proven repeatedly. And every year, it's the same discussion and it's the same faux surprise when a black lead or a female lead or a Latino lead does well. I, every year, every single year, I'm seeing articles like, oh, this hit it out the box office. This, this, this. A study show that movies with minority leads are do uh, exceedingly well. Yet every time the argument is, we don't know if we'll make our money back with this sort of movie or with this lead or with this market or with this whatever. And I think it's BS. I think it's BS because a good movie is a good movie, period. If it made, if you thought it was interesting, it does. That's it. Period is good. Now it's your job now as a producer, as a studio, to put the right people in place. You know, being the director or making sure that the financiers are, you know, spending the right uh, amount of the budget on locations, on camera, on that. All of that stuff is your job to put that stuff together to ensure that the movie will be a hit. That's why people bring movies to you. Otherwise, I would do it myself. Now, uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into this dirty part of the episode. Uh, the one that, reason why we're getting in this, uh, we're going to jump into 
the conversation about the Black Panther movie because we pretty much hit all the uh, <laughs> edges of it, and now we can dig right in. But before we do that, uh, hold on. I'm going to go ahead and give a quick plug to Lord's Apparel. Uh, Lord's is an acronym for Living Out Our Ridiculous Dreams. Uh, they sent me out some apparel, a T-shirt, a couple buttons, stickers, a whole nine. Uh, and it's really just, I mean, you know, I'm always going to support these clean-ass people, collectors that I wear. But um, I just like the concept of living out our ridiculous dreams because that's essentially, you know, it's a black-owned company uh, straight out of Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, uh, just the concept and the idea and the acronym itself is just so dope to me because that's really what, you know, everything that we've talked about, uh, tonight is just, you know, people, you know, betting on themselves, believing in themselves. Even if I don't agree with, um, Monique, I mean, that's what it is. That's what it's about. She believes in herself so much that, that you willing to go get out here and get in this fight, uh, for the thing that you believe in and the, and the dreams that you have for yourself. So shout out to them. Living out our ridiculous dreams. Lloyds, go look them up on uh, Instagram as well. Google them, buy some of that apparel. It's not that crazy expensive, but uh, I, I think it's worth it. So go check them out. And don't forget to listen. If you got Spotify, go listen to the I'm Kind of Famous podcast, dope list, a bunch of songs, things that's relevant to topics we talked about on the show, as well as just like shit that I'm vibing to while I'm mixing and, and, and editing the shows and editing in general. Um, go check that out. The I'm Kind of Famous podcast, Dope List, a bunch of tracks on there, rap, all kind of music, all kind of genres, and hopefully some shit that you like, damn, I ain't never heard of that. And I got it curated, so it's, it got the right flow. And I keep adding new music, and every time I add music, I got to figure out the right spot to drop this new song so that you can let this playlist just run and clean up the crib or just long road trip or you just want to chill with some shit in the background. Make sure you check that out. That's going the link to that is out, is in the show notes if you can't search for it on Spotify. Hey, you been over to Touch Body Works yet? Go to Touch Body Works at evoketouch.com. That's E V O K E touch.com. With skincare products that's so natural, you can eat it. But don't. Now we're going to jump into this next piece of the of the of the show to start to close it out. We're going to jump into this Black Panther conversation. Um, so Black Panther, I saw it. Uh, I saw it the day it came out. Well, it came out on a Thursday. I saw it on a Friday, midday. Um, uh, man, look, I loved it. I, I almost shed a thug tear. Just, <laughs> just the whole movie was, was, and look, fuck it. Spoil is gonna be in it. So. If you ain't trying to hear spoilers yet, you might as well bookmark this part, jump out, go watch the movie, and then come back. But we're going to spoil this motherfucker. So, because ain't no, it's three weeks. If you black and you ain't seen it, you probably racist. You probably got a problem. But <laughs> this, uh, this, I mean, I'm going to tell let me let me paint this picture for you real quick, though. So, did you, I, I know you've seen it. I don't even know why I asked this question. That's why you're on the show. Uh, So, I go, I get my tickets, and I'm be honest with you. When I walked up to the ticket booth, I almost felt like I shouldn't have to tell him why I'm here. Like, when you saw all this black skin, I should have just been able to say one for 12 o'clock, and you knew exactly what movie I was trying <laughs> to get. You know, I mean, every black, it seemed like every black person I saw, I don't live in a black neighborhood, and I had to make a decision. I had to think. Well, all the black people come to my side of town to watch the movie because they assume that it's going to be empty. Or, like, I'm trying to figure out the best way to watch the movie because part of me didn't want my movie-going experience to be disturbed. Then I thought about it. I said, you know what? Nah, I want to be in the culture. Where all the black people at, that's where I want to be for the movie. But I lied a little bit. I went to the one in my neighborhood, and there was a lot of black people there. But um, I get my ticket. I walk down the aisle. I mean, I walk down like the, you know, they tell you your move is in 14, 2, or whatever it is. Go down this way. So I'm going this way. As I'm going in, it's a big theater. They got an elevator. I say, hey, is this the elevator 
to go to the top where my tick where, where my seat. I said, what's the best way? Should I go to the stairs? Or should I use the elevator? While this is happening, I see a black kid coming out the theater. And I see a white woman giving him the business. And I see a usher. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Is this his, her son? Is this a field trip? Like, what's really going on here? Now, she's she got the black kid, and she in his face with the usher. The usher got his little baton, and she's like, I want an apology. I want an apology right now. Black dude just walk out. Look, kid, probably like 18, 19 years old. But I don't know if he was right or wrong, but in my mind, I'm like, damn, we can't have a movie either. You done already started mm-hmm. the shit as soon as the movie. Like, the movie is still in preview mode. And the woman already bitching at the black kid. I'm like, man, this, this, no, nah, this ain't the time. And he left. I'm like, man, you finna miss out on your movie experience for these colonizers? I didn't know that was the term I was supposed <laughs> to use yet. But I, I, <laughs> not my mood is set. Now, I'm, I'm kind of tight. Because I'm like, man, I get up in the elevator. I walk out the elevator. She's still bitching at the usher. I'm like, this ain't, this movie ain't for you, lady. You need to go and go home. Because you not already caused a ruckus and the fucking opening credits ain't even started. But right. I get in there. I watch the movie. It started with the little African, you know, give you some background of what all this stuff mean. And then when they went to the apartment, uh, what I guess New York people call these projects, but the apartment project type area, and then I see a, a public enemy poster on the on the wall, and I'm listening to uh, I think it was was it too short? I don't know. It was black as fuck right from the opening credits, and I was like, oh man, I'm here. The lady next to me, <laughs> she was black. She had them big thick ass dookie braids and shit. I'm like, man, niggas, I'm fucking with y'all right now. I see her low key pull some fucking treats out of her purse, and I'm just, I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. <laughs> I know we ready. We trying to watch this motherfucker right now. We finna have a moment, and and it was everything that I wanted it to be. Like, like I had a white cat in my when I was talking about it on Facebook. I had a white cat. It was like. You know, I had made a, I made a, I made a, uh, uh, trying to get some jokes off. I say, Black Panther is gonna be like roots for black people when it come out, and he was like, "Why would you say roots?" And he got on his little tangent. I said, "Well, I'm trying to break it down." I said, "Well, we know that there's gonna be some subtext in the movie, so." You know, with it being an all-black cast, mostly black cast, there's going to be some subtext. I expected to do this, and it's going to have, like, these racial connotations that we'll be able to pull out. I'm trying to come. I'm, I'm breaking it down why this is an important moment. And then he was like, basically, was like, that's ridiculous. It's just a movie. How can you say that about a movie that we ain't seen yet? Fair enough. Right. And I, I'll, I'll even give him that. So when the movie came out, I watched it, and it was what it was. It was like, I felt great because I'm like, this is why you motherfuckers struggle with race relations. It's because we can tell you exactly why it is what it is. And I even asked him, had he seen Get Out? Because if he said he saw Get Out and thought it was an okay movie, then I'm just like, bro, you racist. You got to be racist to not (laughs) see these things intricate things that are happening and you can just and i told him i think i i know I, I remember telling him it's like the reason why you can walk into black panther and be like i just wanted to be a good movie is because of for lack of a better word the privilege you have to walk into a movie and just watch it as a movie like right. we go into a movie a black movie experience and there's these expectations we want we want it to be good because everyone's watching this. This is a big moment, and if it sucks, we may not get another opportunity to make right. this type of and, movie with this kind of budget. Yeah, and I think you just used the great word, this movie experience. Like, it's a whole experience for us. It's not just the outing, you know, it's not just the regular day at the movies. It's a whole experience because um, it's not the norm. Yeah, and um, I enjoyed What did you think about the movie? I thought the movie was fantastic. Like, I thought it was so good. 
um, on every level, the costume, the sound, the action sequences, the acting itself, the storyline, like all of it, I thought was really great. Um, and I thought it was important. You know, I thought it was, it was special that they did this thing and that people were so excited about it. You know what I mean? Like, People were so excited, and people always be excited about superhero movies, but this was, like, a time where we got to be excited, you know? Like, <laughs> like yeah. people of color got to be, you know, like, nerd out about it and be really excited about it and dress up. And um, I saw it on Thursday. I saw it opening night. And the theater that I went to was in Hollywood, and so they had some of the costumes from the film um, on display in the lobby. And people were, like, dressed up, and people were taking pictures next to this display, next to the costumes, and it was just a thing. Like, it was this great energy. And in the theater that I was in, um, the whole lower level of the theater was Black Panther screenings, and then they also have a dome that's, like, a there's a, it's this historical dome that they were showing it in that as well in 3D. So I actually when we walked towards where, where my theater was, I kept seeing that every theater in that section had different showing times for Black Panther. And I was like, dang, are they showing any other movies? And it turned out that the other movies were all upstairs and all had one theater each, um, which I thought like, wow, that's amazing. That's powerful. That's something historical. And, and for it to be a movie doing this well that was not about struggle or slavery or drugs or violence or you know I mean there was violence but you know for it to be something like that something that was like a superhero like that was just a big thing and African at the same time like I thought it was great I thought they did a fantastic job and the one of the the dopest like we said it's uh, it, it, and experience in it and it is but like this what you was mentioning before um i'm gonna say the break because you don't know that i just inserted some ads <laughs> between these sections but <laughs> before the break you said um fuck i just i just lost it i just lost it uh we're talking about representation matters uh oh. fuck i forgot what i was about to say uh what did you say before i <laughs> Uh, it, <laughs> Something right. about I, I was talking about create having to create your own lane and representation matters and oh I I said how you know when I go to auditions like it's not really there's not stuff for me I'm auditioning for something that's written for someone else. Fuck it, I ain't gonna remember. But what I think is dope. <laughs> what I think what what I find to to be appealing about i mean not appealing but like this moment wasn't just um like this was more than a move when you get when you get the oh we was talking about uh being able to sell uh uh people not the audience not coming to support mm, films mm -hmm. like this what was crazy is like there was nothing about this that really said black people needed to be there and somehow we turned a comic book movie. Because for all intents and purposes, we didn't know it was going to do what it did. But black people felt compelled to be a part of this as more than the movie, to be a moment. And, you know, we you this Marvel movie masterpiece thing that happens, people go, you know, the nerds go to it, the people who just in general love these films go to it, comic book fans, superhero fans go to this. But... What this movie was able to do in the box office and the support virally, and I'm going to also say mm -hmm. non-violently, uh, that was able to happen with this film showed you like how significant that black ticket can be when you put the 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 buff the budget and the effort into making sure the awareness for the film is out there because this like again like this isn't the struggle this isn't slavery this isn't some gang this ain't training day this ain't you know a bunch of rappers and shit trying to make a film like this is just a movie just another movie in this um comic book universe and it shows you like we'll come we'll we'll show up just just let us know. Just let us know where it's at. We show it's like a potluck. Let me know where the food at. 
We'll go. Right. And and we did Yo. and celebrated it. Like 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 I mean we broke records the first week. Man, let me tell you, the black dollar is strong. It is so strong. That's why whenever you know, whenever something crazy happens in politics or whatever, it's always people saying, like, you need to boycott Home Depot, boycott this person, boycott this because they support X, Y, Z, or they races, or they support killing people, or, you know, whatever. And folk, or they don't, you know, they don't support black people, whatever. And people always be like, that's crazy. I can't do that. It's not going to make a difference. Yo, it makes a difference. The black dollar is so daggone strong. If black people did not show up and show out to Black Panther, it would not be well on its way to crossing the $1 billion line. And it's only been out how many weeks? Like two or three? It's close to crossing $1 billion uh, by the end of this week. Like that is crazy. If they if we did not show up, it would not be anywhere near those numbers. So, and I'm gonna tie this back to Monique. Oh, you didn't think I could do that? Okay. Everything is crazy until it's proven. You know what I'm saying? People say, "Oh no, black people boycott and stuff. It don't. It won't do nothing. And these people still gonna have money. It's not, it doesn't matter. Black people starring in a movie. It doesn't matter. They're not gonna make this money. Black people as a superhero. Nobody's gonna see that. Nobody's gonna watch that. People aren't gonna come out for it. A black man in the lead dressed in African garb. Don't nobody wanna see that. <laughs> Check yeah, this out. it was real crazy. Like mm-hmm. in one year, in one year, twelve months time. Get Out broke records, horror movie, black black written horror movie, Girls Trip come out, what, roughly that summer or some shit like that, comedy, black lead film, uh, black leads, women, director, and then we do the same thing with a superhero movie, three different genres that we pr- practically killed the box office uh, right. In different Three different ways. genres that we usually are not in, that we are usually not included in. We're usually not in horror. We're usually not in the superhero realm. And even these uh, rom com female, you know, girl buddy movies, we don't have. And we killed all of those categories. That shit is magnificent. That it, what they say, black excellence. And mm-hmm. now, and now, what we did, I mean, we proved this point, and, and as you were saying earlier, like, like, you can, if you, we'll, 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 we'll support it. Just make it. And I, and and even if we don't support it, I also feel like, and I'm, I always make this argument is that I feel like we need to have the same opportunity to make a great movie as Scorsese and as bad of a movie as. Um, fucking i i can't think his name adam sandler like i i think we should be able to exist across that scale it shouldn't be i shouldn't feel like i have to overly support a black film in order for more black films to be made for x Mm -hmm. amount of genres and then like like the same way people like we had to treat obama it had to be exceptionally well it couldn't just be like a good movie these are like three Mm -hmm. movies that were exceptionally well are great from the film make from the film itself all the way to the box office, and it showed that not only will black people go see it with a great powerful dollar, but white people go see it, Hispanics go see it, like everyone's talking about it. Um, so that's right. dope. But the extra piece that comes with Black Panther, where you mentioned, and I've seen you on this run of the representation matters, is like one of the dopest things. I can't remember how I saw it when I saw it, but online I saw. Two little black kids at a on a at a movie poster, and they're just kind of pointing out, "I'm him, I'm him, I'm him." And it's like, damn, we got like legitimate superheroes, <laughs> or in a superhero <laughs> film on a movie where my son and other minority kids, and maybe even white kids, that'd be dope to even see a white kid point at this poster and being like, "Oh, I'm Chala or whatever." Probably won't happen, but mm-hmm. it'd be dope to see. 
Uh, but why not? Because when we were kids, we was over here talking about we was Power Rangers. I, you know, Power Rangers. I had the Pink Ranger who was a white girl, or the Yellow Ranger who was Asian. Those are who I had to choose from. And I was over here saying I was Power Ranger. I was Pink Ranger for Halloween. So why shouldn't a white kid be able to look at Black I, Panther and say okay. like, Yeah, I'm T'Challa. I'm glad you asked. I think you would ask. So we'll circle right back to the beginning because white men who start off with little boys are told something different their entire life. Right. So I don't know how they look at it. You know, I, I personally feel like my kids are the generation that won't give a fuck about none of this racial shit. But, like, that's the, hopefully not the reality. That's the reality, I think. Hopefully that's not the reality that is. But, yeah, that would be, that would be super dope um, to see kids playing Black Panther. Because it was some dope shit now. As an as a action film, that was some dope shit going on in that movie. You yeah know, just in general so i mean hopefully that'd be dope you know uh uh halloween you have a little white kid with a uh man halloween coming and we're gonna have one of the probably dopest <laughs> costumes out there so man this is crazy um i'm gonna be killmonger <laughs> let's go and jump into the movie killmonger now we can jump we're gonna jump around so whatever you want to say just say the shit but killmonger lowest of keys I always say this about a good villain in general. And I think about this when I'm trying to write my own script when I'm cuz I like horror films and I always feel like I'll just say this shit like a good villain you almost agree with. And mm-hmm. Killmonger like the Joker in Batman or Bane in Dark Knight is like if I knew he wasn't crazy this motherfucker's talking some real shit right now. Like, we really could take this motherfucker over if the people rise up. And what Killmonger was saying was dope in the way, like, I don't necessarily agree with these hotel dudes, uh, black dudes or or super pro-black dudes or people that, that be going on their little rants on social media and stuff like that. But what he was saying was the type of shit that they were saying. They They... The sentiment that they have when they talk about we need to rise up for our people and do all this for our people and get make these motherfuckers white people uh uh not necessarily bow down to us well i guess bow down to us feel the wrath of what we felt for years and like part of me in the movie i was like can we just i i pretty i kind of feel like they shot all the killmonger scenes where he took over and the vision that he had for like how he saw the world and they had to leave it on the cutting room flow just like well, well we'll shoot it but just in case let's make sure we cut that out we don't want to <laughs> ruffle too many feathers because i was like i kind of want to see what his world looked like before we get too far along because Chala might be on this bullshit we don't want to make no uh we don't want to start no revolution quite yet so we have to cut it um <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the comic book history, but from Me the most of us don't <laughs> comic from the comic book aficionados who I have on my social media feeds, um, I think there's more to come from Killmonger. So there's a lot that is in the comic books on a lot of the different characters that we haven't seen yet, from what I'm understanding. So it could be later you know well unless um, killmonger can pull a goddamn knife out his chest I, i'm not pretty <laughs> we're gonna see i mean we we well, pretty much gonna you have get to a think secret. about it well here's the thing did he, yeah he killed himself he you know killed himself but how long did they stay there did t'challa pick him up and run him to the lab and use our brain you know what i'm saying there's so, it's superhero world there's so much stuff that could have happened yeah, we they, didn't see. There's did, so much, you know what I mean. They they stay bringing people back from the dead all the time. Hey, we, <laughs> hey, all this money we just made, we know we getting a sequel. So I mean, right, it's coming. And he did a fantastic job. So I mean, Michael B. Jordan has been getting so much praise that you know I I, I would not be surprised if they found a way to bring him back, either by backtracking in the story or by you know now he was saved by vibranium against his will and he was angry about it and 
then maybe he came over to their side and maybe he didn't. I don't know. There's so many options, I think. Here's another thing that I loved about the film, and it uh, and it's some of these uh, probably lightweight subtextual things that was happening, but I like the role of women in this film. And, and kind of almost right out the gate where we got – you know some of the the child's relationship, uh, or you know his 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 uh, situationship uh, that was going on <laughs> early, but as well as like the sister, little sister, kid sister, like her energy. Like I felt like every version of the black woman that I know was represented in that film, down to my sister, to my mom, to. You know, just just all these different flavors of black women was woman was there, and even their role in a man's life, a black male's man's life, was like all represented there, all the way down to like them knowing better and having great foreshadowing for you and great advice for you, and our stubbornness to listen to our moms or the women in our life that are really looking out for us but we kind of don't want to listen to them because you don't know what you're talking about Mm -hmm. yeah i mean black women well i ain't gonna make no dramatic statements but yes (laughs) go on jump out there go on jump out on that ledge (laughs) we came from the black woman black woman versus the world the earth but (laughs) oh shit you know i shouldn't have let you civilization (laughs) civilization You know, uh, no, but for real, like, I think that you're right. Like, it did show the strength of black women. It showed how smart they can be, how funny they can be, how deeply they love and care, how loyal they are, how committed, how strong. Um, It showed so many facets of black women, and they were positive facets, which I think is really awesome because, you know, black women are often underrepresented and misrepresented. in in media and in entertainment as well, you, you know. You mean between, all black women ain't thoughts? What? What? Right. You know, <laughs> they're not angry bitches, or they're not hoes, or they're not, you know, baby mamas or strung out. Yeah, there's there's other type of black women. It's amazing. Holly Berry That's missed amazing. her chance, boy. She she could have stayed in there and been a part of this. Uh, um. Another. Well, you you never know because I think I might be wrong. So anyone out there who is like super into comics, y'all can comment <laughs> or whatever and let us know. But um, I believe Storm is from Wakanda or somehow connected to Black Panther, Man. if I'm not mistaken. So when did you? Yeah. I didn't know I was talking I'm to just... an expert. <laughs> Hey, I got a lot of friends who like superheroes and comic books. I've just been hearing tidbits and here and there. I could be misstating because, you know, none of it makes sense to me. But I believe, if I'm not mistaken, she's somehow connected to Wakanda and Black Panther. Here's another piece. uh, uh, Speaking of Wakanda, I should just use that as the uh, segue. Speaking of Wakanda, um, (laughs) one of the dope, another dope thing, um, and it was a moment I had in the movie, and I don't know. I, I, I've stayed away from analysis because I'd never want to look at analysis before I talk about something because uh, I wanted to be my raw reaction to it. But watching Wakanda, one of the things that I felt about it, I did feel like it was, a tr- in my opinion, a true representation of black the black stereotypical life or something like that. And when I say that, I mean, like, so they go to Africa. Wakanda has is supposed to have all these rich resources. But then on the surface, it looks the way it looks. But then when you get under Wakanda, you see pretty much a flourishing ecosystem that these people live in. And mm. I could only think back to, like, you know, how I grew up where, like, you live in the hood, and the people on the outside look at it a certain way. But then once you in there and you really kind of see how this works and you see niggas with rims and shit, and, you know, everyone's laid out in the greatest fashions, the latest fashions or whatever, like, we figure out how to flourish and come up with our own language in ways that 
is mm-hmm. um, that kind of keeps the people out, keep them away, but not realize, like, within our own ecosystem, we make this shit work even though y'all don't fuck with us like that. We got this shit that's going on that keeps us, you know, going. Now, in ways I looked at vibramium is that a drug, you know, in ways, because sometimes or most times in black neighborhoods, like drugs are the thing that funnel, funnels the neighborhood, helps build the neighborhood for better or worse. And, you know, there's another way I looked at it. So it was just like another, like the, what I saw from it, um, coming from where I come from, it was like, yo, this is like, even Wakanda has its own character that can be seen for one way on the surface or we can dig a little deeper and see something else. Now, one of the other dope things is like this idea of, uh, you know, technology and um, I forget what it's called, like this this advanced futuristic thing that we're that they're creating where you can almost look at Africa for real, for real and see like there's some things that are being developed away from the U- United States that we may at some point need to get from Africans because they've been developing this and, and going to use it to leverage to help build their own income and 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 and, and build some some of these uh, African nations up using you know the the things that they're creating and we buy it and outsource it or whatever import it. But anyway, that was just like like an examination I had on Wakanda itself uh, from a different aspect. Well, see, I saw it, I saw the vibranium differently, um, which is interesting. I mean, I'll, I will note that I did not grow up in what people consider the hood. Um, so maybe that, based off what you said, maybe that's the reason that I saw it differently. I don't, I don't know. But I actually saw vibranium as being the untapped, um, knowledge and uh, skills of black people and of African cultures, this thing that's under the surface that most of us don't realize is there, um, but that very much exists and makes us rich and useful and powerful beyond measure, more than we even know, and definitely more than the rest of the world knows. That's how I saw it, Um, like, like literally an untapped source of wealth and energy and you don't uh, even know what you're saying right now you don't even realize what you just said right now when you think when you take what you just said that shit that 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 real shit you just said right there and you you think about the only time that we fight each other is when we take away Mm -hmm. that knowledge and that 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 all that real shit you just said now we fighting each other for who's the best, who should take over, who should run this shit. Is when we take away these these powerful resources that are untapped, and we we cherish it. You know, like like reading, like education, like all the stuff that we need that's right there, right up under us that we don't take advantage of, and we rely on other people to lead us because we won't take advantage of those. Man, you just said some real shit. You got me over here. Right. Thinking. All right. I mean, that's like what I said earlier about how black people don't ask for more because they don't know that they can. You know, it's it's exactly what I was saying earlier, the difference between minorities and white men and how they think that they are supposed to have this power because they were told that they have it. And black people were told that they don't, you know. So, of course, you don't see it under the surface when you're told that you don't have it, that there's nothing there. Which is exactly what the world is being told in Black Panther. They're being told that there's nothing there. That Wakanda is the poorest nation. That's what that's what everyone believes. Now, let's go. Let's, what about the white man? Now, the white man jumped the white out man who there. Came in? White man came up in there. And it was like, Umbuku was like, "Man, shut your bitch ass up, man. Why you talking? Why did all this black wealth is in the room?" <laughs> like like I enjoyed that I don't know why that tickled me so much it's like they shut this motherfucker up right it's like you're not in Kansas anymore <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah man I think 
that <laughs> I think that it's something that has to be said. Like, honestly, the reason that we are where we are and we can't seem to progress, we meaning the world, not just black people, is because a lot of times loud ass white men don't shut up. And because they I mean, think just, they know, circling back to the beginning of the film, these motherfuckers think they know us better than we know us. Right. You know, so they don't, you know, I think it's necessary. But I think what I did like about, I liked that moment, but I also liked that the guy shut the fuck up and did what, you know what I mean? They, they, he learned stuff. They showed him things and he learned and he worked with them to, destroy you know the evil or whatever killmonger and his people but like it required him listening in order to be able to progress he had to listen first you know which is an interesting statement because in order for us to progress as a world and specifically as a nation in america people need to listen specifically the white men in power need to listen now, what you saying, I, I thought, when I wanted to do this show, I, I said to myself, I got to put these uh, situations that I went through going into this show on blast. I, I felt like, man, I'm going to be angry on my show. I'm going to be cussing. I'm going to be yelling all this shit. But I can't, like, I, I'm going to bring it up. But I'm a tr- I'm, I know I'm not going to be angry about it because I don't give a fuck anymore because it, it really – Represents what you just said about if they shut up and listen. And I, when I made the state after fighting with one dumbass uh, white dude about this movie that hadn't came out, I had to deal with another one that was telling me that our struggle um, is basically a cop out. You know, uh, racism, blaming racism is a cop out. This whole thing, and. And what bothered me more, not even saying it's a cop out, because teachers on that's what you feel, you know, in ways maybe sometimes we do use that as an excuse. But I can't admit that to the white man. Come on. Um mm. But what annoyed me more is that the fact that we got people explaining to you why this is these things is necessary. And I remember I told him, like, you know, it's kind, it's just a representation. Sometimes we need these things to feel a certain way that these opportunities are out there. I said it's like Obama. Obama probably didn't do as much shit as he could have. But in general, to see that, that's a moment where we can go, damn, all right, I guess anything can be possible. My, I can be president. My great-granddad died at 104, and I remember – um, like three years ago, and I remember having that conversation. Like, did you think you would ever see this happen? He was like, "Nah, you couldn't tell me there was ever be a black president." And he get to live through. He he lived a hundred years. A hundred mm-hmm. years ago is some crazy shit going. Like we talking clan, mm-hmm. we talking a bunch of shit that he lived through, and then throughout all that he gets to see a black president. And when we tell you that, I tell you why that why that mattered, and you tell me. Well, Obama uh, did a lot of pain for black people or or was really bad for black people. I'm like, how the fuck can a white man tell me how another black, like, please tell me more about how my black experience is, what my black experience, (laughs) what these black moments mean to me. Please tell me more about that. And I asked him, at some point I asked him, tell me what racism feels like. And he he says some horse shit like um, um, it's it's taking one step forward, two steps back, and I'm just like motherfucker, racism ain't an inconvenience, it ain't a set setback. This is an inherent thing. And I asked him like inherently, do you think as a white man inherently that you have more opportunity than I have? Just inherently, and he's like, no. You have more opportunity than me. I say we can't even agree on that. Then we can't Whoa. even have this conversation. Cause we talking. I and I told and he he told me an anecdote where he was talking about his daughter. He says his daughter dates a black kid. He's like this black kid is an amazing kid. He's smart. He's uh, intelligent. And they call they they call him all these names. And then they talk. They treat my daughter. They tell my daughter that you're a nigger lover. 
and all this shit. They treat her bad. Not realizing that this kid is top of the class, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, I dig that. That sucks for your daughter. Now think about this. This kid wakes up every day looking the way he looks, and he's only treated that way just because he woke up that day. Your daughter can break up with this dude, and she'll be done dealing with that, and he'll still deal with that, deal with them same situation. And to me, when you got something, and I told him, like, what you're saying to me is like, a battered wife syndrome. Like, how do you? I can't just tell a battered woman to get over it because she's been systematically torn down day after day, week after week, year after year, and then all of a sudden she get a chance at something, and she's not comfortable with it, or she doesn't know how to treat it, and she needs these things in her way and in her life to to help let her know. Look, it's okay. Look, here's another opportunity for a person like you. Like that's what you're telling us to get over something that we didn't create. This we were in. Mm-hmm. We we came into this moment. We was dragged into this, and I could. I, I was I was perplexed because here's another fucking fuckery thing that he said it's like it's a plantation mindset and i had to tell him like bro plantation mindset what the fuck do you think that came from like i was gonna say who created that that's a real thing this is not like some pseudoscience theory that comes from an actual thing and i said who do you think created that and he was like america i said i don't know what the fuck you're talking about man like i really don't know what you're talking about that's a white thing y'all made a subservient and when we finally get right. freedom we got to build up to a, a sense of pride and a sense of uh the, like this thing that the vibranium aspect that you mentioned like we got we this shit is here but we don't really even realize it because we have been we we, we under achieve the things that we should just have we should expect and they mm-hmm. think, and he sits here and he has this, he says to me, plantation mindset as if he, like, this is just something that they came up and they set up in a lab and thought about and said, you know what, maybe it's kind of like a plantation. No, this is an actual real metaphor to something that actually happened. Martin Luther King could still be alive today. We just was able to vote in my mom's lifetime. We have people right. that we can go talk to today. Who could tell you what it was like to not be equal, to sit in the back, to to not go into the same restaurant, to not have the same opportunities, to not get jobs? We got people who lived in that moment today, and you telling me this shit is a cop out? Like this blows my mind. So like I look at a movie like this, like Black Panther, Get Out. Like I look at the film and entertainment industry, and I see like this is why art is a very art does so much. For people outside of entertain, if it's a hundred people that are entertained by a movie and five of them can see the underlining like messages in them, like them five people may go on and be like, I was inspired by this movie and I want to go talk to kids. Cause you look at a, the end of the end of Black Panther, goddamn made me want to start doing some charity work. Like, man, let me get out here and talk to these kids. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, it's it's important to see things reflected on the screen that we need to be reflecting in our lives. You know what I mean? Or that as charity work or seeing positive um, role models or whatever. Uh, and representation, when I say representation matters, that goes for so many things. You know, rep, like showing the smart uh, black female in tech which is what they did with uh, his sister Mm. in the movie. You know, that is representation. That's a very specific form of representation because how many black women are in tech, you know what I mean, that are at high levels? Um, Showing a black president, even though he was the president of an African nation, they showed a black president who was leading his people and who was speaking at the UN. That is representation that matters. Uh, It's just... All of it, all of it shows different um, facets of things that we're not usually seeing, and it makes you feel a certain way. It makes you think, "Oh, I can maybe do X, Y, Z." And it's so small, and it's so 
um, subversive. We think we don't think much about it until we see something and realize that we never saw before. You know what I mean? Like we've lived our lives and things have been the way they've been. And we, you know, I grew up watching Saved by the Bell and uh, hey, Power Slater. Rangers and all that stuff. Yeah, you know, I watched all that stuff and I didn't notice anything bad or good or you know i didn't know anything about it and it's not until i was older and then i start, and then you know i saw my mom watching living single and that was black women i didn't think anything about the fact that they were black women i really didn't not at the time but then as i'm older and i think yeah i want to be a strong black woman or i want to be a black woman who does xyz and i try to think of examples and i have that example you know i say oh well uh, Khadijah dressed like this or carried herself this way or Maxine, you know, she was a lawyer and when she was debating people, she always made her points in this sort of manner and she was spicy. You know, there's all these Man, things that we can pull from. I never realized how groundbreaking that show was. Yeah. Like, that was it like, was the same as that format as Friends. I was going to say, that was like Black Friends. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just you talking about mm-hmm. I said, man, that's like the Black Friends. Man. Exactly. Did friends come before and you see single? those things? Nope, nope, so sure didn't. Oh man, mm-hmm. see, we've been there. See, that, yeah. that, that, man, that's crazy. Like, I, like, I it's never crazy, even right? thought about it until like right now. Like, yo, that, cause that show was a hit. Like, that was a, that was a banger right there. It was a huge hit. And people, when you're, when we were watching it, we weren't thinking about, oh, it's representation and it's this and that. We weren't thinking about that, but we were glued to it, right? Why were we so glued to it? Because there was nothing else that was showing that. It's just like the Cosby's. When the Cosby show and later on... Um, Different World. Uh, what was the story? Different World. When those shows came out and were on, enrollment, black enrollment in colleges, specifically at HBCUs, went through the roof. Do you think people were saying, were literally saying to themselves, well, Denise went to Hillman, so I'm going to go to H. People weren't actually saying those exact words to themselves, but they were feeling like more inspired to do it just through the field trade. It's, it's subliminal. You know what I mean? It's subliminal messaging that you, have, you now have in your head. Now, yeah, we've seen college on TV before. We've seen families on TV before, but we hadn't seen families that looked like us. We hadn't seen colleges that looked like us. We hadn't seen people on the yard. Uh, you know, step in and all that stuff on TV. We might have heard about it. You might have your cousin or your uncle who comes to the cookout and does some stuff. But, like, you didn't, like, really see it and feel it and say, oh, I want to experience that. I want to go there. You know what I mean? Until those shows came about. You didn't see... The reason the coffee show was so groundbreaking and uh, had such an impact was because you had a Black doctor and a Black lawyer as parents living in a brownstone with a with how many kids do they have like four or five kids and they were a family a nuclear family but not just your regular humdrum you know whatever family a stay-at-home mom or poor or whatever they were successful and we hadn't seen that successful, and whether we realized it or not su- it, successful it and that. was having like real issues you know what i mean like Adopted right. kids and drugs and all this shit, and navigating through those issues comedically, but also like in very real ways. Um, mm-hmm. In this conversation, I'm, I'm kind of feeling there was a, you know, we started a lot of this talking about like, you know, where black shows and things fall into uh, this entertainment. Uh, at, uh, Atlanta season has just started. Um, we got a couple little black um, whodunits out there with the Tupac and Biggie thing. Um, but I just realized, like, there is a section of time where I think the black shows, black entertainment, was just gutted because when I think when we look at Good Times two two seven, um. Um, things in that era, I can't, I can't think of everything, but things in that era, then we get, you know, in that Cosby era where we got, you know, the Cosby shows, different world, all that type of stuff. Then we, at some point we get, um, living single, the Wayans brothers and, you know, that group of shows. And we had a lot of movies as well. And then somewhere after that point, 
we just start losing shows. And now it's right. All, so now I do really when I, I I say black renaissance, but I kind of feel like it's more of a black resurgence that's happening in entertainment where I don't I don't know what it is. Like just just because I'm thinking about it as I'm saying, it's like something happened somewhere where they like. I don't know. Are, are we just in a cycle where, all right, now we getting, you know, more? Uh, I don't know what it is. I don't know what because because like when you when you just mentioned like living single, you think about it, that was a lot of shows. Family Matters, fucking a lot of shows that was existing in those pockets. Maybe not particularly produced by black people, but you had black leads. You had black people, you know, in these shows. I mean, Kelsey Grandma made a whole goddamn. What's this? I forget right. what his show is called, but uh, girlfriends. He did girlfriends. Yeah, like like you have these a few in between, but like we were like we had a lot of shit on TV. At, the WB was all black shit, basically. Right. <laughs> and then we somewhere yeah. lost that way, and now we're kind of back in this place of I don't know. Maybe it's because sitcoms were popular as fuck as well at the time. I think that's a huge part of it. I think sitcoms are very popular and um, that formula was very popular. And I think in general, across the board, not just black shows, I think that format went out the window. You know, that was no longer the thing that people started craving. Uh, We started getting a lot of single cam stuff. You know, we started getting stuff like The Office and Modern Family and things that are done in a whole different style. Um, I also think that that stuff became so, it became unrelatable to an extent, right? Because it was so fantastical, it was sitcom, so it's notched up. Even, not just the black shows, but again, the white shows as well. Think of Friends and, and I don't know, any other, uh, Dharma and Greg, all that sort of stuff. It's very notched up. Um, and we kind of, as a, as a country, I think the tone shifted towards more realistic, more drama, more... Um, you know, actually wanting to see, feel like you're talking directly to a person, that sort of thing. So it kind of changed over in that way. And also not having morals. If you, I remember shows in the 90s, there being a moral to the story. By the time you got to the end, there was a lesson. Yeah. And I think that those shows don't exist as, as much anymore either, where it's like, and now we're going to tie it up in a bow. That kind of went out the, w- the window. And specifically with black shows, I think... Um, there we saw a lot of representation in a certain way that we hadn't seen before which was awesome but then we also realized that those things did not reflect a lot of people who actually existed in life you know because my life did not look anything like the cosby's my life didn't look anything like martin it didn't look like anything like that so it was great to see that as the fantasy but as we started as the country and as the interest and the tone of stuff started to switch more towards reality and things that felt um, like a reflection of, of ourselves, a real reflection of ourselves in our current circumstances. So you started to get stuff like The Wire. You started to get stuff that was a little more gritty um, and that showed different types of people. Now, that's you could say that's a plus, plus and a negative because <laughs> those types that we started to see were not necessarily the most positive ways to view black people. But I think it um, it showed us a little bit more of how people felt like their everyday lives were. The interesting thing with that shift, too, is that also during that time, the uh, the prison pipeline really got boosted up. Mm. And then, you know, we started to see this shift. Um, towards things depicting more gang life or more rough circumstances or poor people or struggle or whatever. We started to see that pick up more um, in a gritty way as opposed to a good times way. See, good times, they were scraping to get by and it was all great and fun and the projects and yay, it's all good. But then we started to get, like I said, the wire and stuff that was more gritty and more like this is real life, this is real shit, it's real out here. Um and that came after the 90s, that came towards, you know, as the 90s was curving around, we were seeing more people going to prison. We were seeing, um, you know, drugs and all this stuff kind of for what it really was. And, and that whole glamour and that 
fantasy that, that came in in the 80s and the, uh, the late 80s and the early 90s with Cosby and all of that kind of started to uh, go away. You know, it kind of started to not be realistic anymore. Um, now, now we're in a new, the, like you said, a resurgence or a renaissance where people are making more stories that I think the common thread is weird weird people people who are yeah. you know not necessarily the coolest and not and again these are people who have not been represented because and and that's why i think it's awesome because for me like i said my family i didn't experience well we was a little we was a little cosy like but <laughs> <laughs> but neither my neither of my parents is a, is a lawyer or a doctor and i don't have multiple siblings um i didn't go to an hbcu um I also didn't have the life of like Martin and Gina. That was absurd and that was wild and crazy. That wasn't my experience either. So none of that stuff was my experience. Home, um, not home, family matters. That wasn't my experience. I didn't live in the same house my whole childhood and have some crazy person who came over. None of that was real for me. Um, it wasn't crazy. He then, was smart. <laughs> I mean, he was, you know, he was silly, you know. <laughs> crazy is not the right word. And then I also, also the wire and Oz and all that gritty stuff was not real for me either. So now we have the people who, okay, that didn't work. That's not me. That's not me. Oh, but here I am. So now we got Insecure. We got Atlanta. We got, uh, I don't know, Master of None. We have whatever, Mindy's show with mm. Mindy Colleen. Um, We have all these different things that are showing quirky people of color. You know, smart, quirky, don't quite fit in. Um, and we're seeing them in different environments because Atlanta has quirkiness to it, but they're in Atlanta. So yeah. it's like, what happens when you're weird and you're quirky and you're a dreamer, but you're in the hood? What yeah. is that like? Yeah, and that's you know, what, what, insecure. what I'm digging is like, I, what I don't want, I, I hope it doesn't happen. I don't want to like get rid of environments and genres to just look at one sort of thing. I hope that we continue a a trend of just you know there's something for everybody like is is if mm -hmm. you if you like hood shows let's get you some hood shows if you like you know what uh uh uh, uh awkward black uh, uh insecure uh we got that for you like these different facets and experiences because it goes back to what i say like i think we need to be able to make good at as good as scorsese as bad as sadler and, and we can have our own friends or, or or whatever that version is of friends for black people, whatever that version is for um, the court show, I guess how to get away with murder. But like, I want to, I want to make sure like everything is there. So it's not like this is a black show. It's just another show on TV that people either like or don't like. Um, right. And, and, and just, re cause I like that. I, I like that. Um, you know, Atlanta kind of feels like, black curb um it just yeah it, it feels right and uh uh and, and that way of somewhat being self-aware um uh yeah self-aware of itself so but we're gonna go ahead and wrap this wind this down because uh i think we hit everything and the crazy thing <laughs> the crazy thing is like we talked we i mean i said spoiler like we really didn't spoil black panther it just shows i think and I guess this is going to happen every time we talk about a movie, but it just shows like you can dig deeper in film. And I think that's what's dope about you being in the, the entertainment industry. Me trying to do it the way that I do it is like being able to see beyond like movies in general. I don't think have to be surface. I don't think it just has to be what it is. And between the conversation about Get Out, the conversation we was able to have with Black Panther, uh, and even sort of the things that we get with Monique, like in the comedy world, is like these things are like bigger than the surface. Um, right. I watched, I recently watched the last Dave Chappelle special, The Bird Something or Other. And like I'm looking at it, I'm like, I think he only told three jokes throughout the whole show, the whole forty <laughs> something minutes, because a lot of it was like peeling back. And I think that's the beauty of good comedy is uh, it's it's a absurdist way of looking at what's happening. Um, mm -hmm. you know, like with situationships, 
uh I wrote some of the jokes that I said that seemed like it just came naturally out of the conversation, but it was mostly the things that like I see within a relationship that you know uh, one of the jokes that, that I mean I guess it's not gonna be on the video, but the audio version it was like I said um who how many boyfriends went to sleep early on Valentine's Day, but y'all went out to eat on the 15th. Like, that happens. Because <laughs> niggas be faking, and you went for, you know, a female goes for the okie doke, but that's like a real thing. And we can talk about that. Like, are you a dummy? Are you just letting this dude slick you over? Like, this is a real conversation that can be had that's hidden behind jokes. And I think that's the beauty about comedy. I think that's the beauty of good filmmaking, good screenwriting, uh, or a good script and things like that, where you can take this surface feeling, and if you're willing to engage into that deeper conversation or look beyond the surface, you can and have something that is more uh, uh, nourishing, or you can just enjoy what it is for what it is. Um, and right. with Black Panther, we had the conversation, and somehow we got into wherever we're at right now, by just examining some of these things that happen within a comic book superhero f film that is right. uh, killing Iron Man. And I'm going to say this before we leave. Um, if they make a Captain America versus Black Panther, um, y'all with the bullshit. I ain't having no parts of it. There's no way we're going to have a movie that's Captain America versus Black Panther because I know what y'all trying to do. And we're not letting that <laughs> shit fly. Uh, hilarious. So, you, well, you, well, I ain't got no comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, no, if you want to hire me, I will be in the movie. I ain't got no comment, man. That's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> we'll have to come back for that one. But anyway, uh, once you, here, let me, I'm going to ask you this. We're going to leave with this. What are you watching? What are you listening to? What am I watching? Well, I just started season two of Atlanta. Uh, premiere was just last week. I'm also watching The Shy, and I just finished um, Waco, which is a nice little mini series, six part mini series. I highly recommend that. that I started. Waco, I got, I'm, I'm three episodes in. That shit is crazy. That shit is it's crazy. very very good. Yeah. What am I listening to? I'm actually not listening to anything right now. So I am open to suggestions. Uh, anyone I, wants to give me suggestions via this suggestion. podcast? I got a suggestion. I, I, it depends on what, what flavor you're feeling. Uh, so right now, right now, um, I'm listening to Victory Lap, Nipsey Hussle's album. That's like, I mean, I, it's like a black TED talk over music, like, it's 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 okay. it's West Coast. It's hard as fuck. It's dope to me. It's lyrical as fuck. And then he giving you some jewels inside of that music. Like it's it's crazy because you can listen to it again. You can listen to a surface music, or you can listen to something deeper than music that that he's saying in these lyrics. So I think Nipsey Hustle. But I just let me pull up my Spotify. I just got into this album today. Uh. And uh, hold up before I, I'm looking for it, but I got a podcast people need to jump on, The Atlanta Murderer. Like, I've been listening to this podcast. I've been binging it because I thought uh, it was all done. Apparently, there's two more episodes, so I've been listening to every episode. Atlanta Murderer. It's about Wayne Williams, the the, the Atlanta ch child killer. Uh, and mm. it's this shit is amazing. This, this is some of the greatest storytelling well, I ain't going to say, no, it's not. That's a lie. I I'm embellishing. But it's good. <laughs> it's really good storytelling and kind of kind of peels some layers back to maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't know. But he's they, they're interviewing a lot of people and they're kind of retracing the steps on that. And it's actually has inspired me to one of the next projects I think I'm going to do uh, as a podcast and as a documentary. But there's another album for you. You want to get into a little R&B, a little music. It's JMSN. That's the name of uh, the artist. And the album I was listening to was called, uh, what is it called? 
Nah, that ain't it. That ain't it. See all albums. Pol- Look, I don't know how to say this, but it's spelled P L L A J E. Uh Okay. Check that album out by JMSN. Uh it's soulful as fuck. What's dope about it? It feels like one long track. You really don't even notice that the beat is flipping on you the way he transitioned from one song to another. So I was four songs in. I was like, God damn, this is a long ass song. Nah, they was already they hit me with four tracks that quick. Um, okay. What am All I right. watching? Um, what am I watching? I don't. I ain't really watching. I'm about to start Black Mirror. I'm about to start the new season of Black Mirror. I'm behind on that shit. Uh, jumping into the Tupac. I wanted to do the Tupac, like a podcast special, the Tupac Biggie thing. But Netflix done spoiled me. And it's hard. It's really hard to watch schedule programming. Like, I need to watch. I want to watch <laughs> everything. Once you hit me for part one, I want to see part two. But I'm I'm a, I'm a catch up on uh, it's two episodes in so I'm gonna catch up on this Tupac thing I'm gonna jump on Atlanta uh I yeah I ain't got nothing for nobody to watch because I'm I'm too busy watching fucking Donald Trump burn this bitch down but no 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 don't Man. don't say don't don't say nothing <laughs> <laughs> um well. We'll wrap it up. So, once you tell people where to find you, if you want to be found on social media, or whatever you got going, if not, you ain't got to. <laughs> you can find me on social media on every platform, but the one I use the most is Instagram under Chanel Bosch, Bosch, C H A N E L B O S H. Look me up. I use my real name on everything because i want to make sure you find me hey, i'm gonna say this i'm gonna jump I'm, I'm just gonna hand put this on blast chanel took some pictures some time ago that was popping i'm gonna tell you right now <laughs> them motherfuckers was all right so you go on, go on jump over to that gram see what i was talking about hit them hearts because that <laughs> motherfucker damn, damn anyway uh <laughs> we're uh we're we're pretty we're a couple episodes away from putting out the situation ship uh live recording um i'm planning another event i think late spring or summer i haven't decided yet so we'll do another event uh but big shout out to big sam and autumn black for queen x magazine for joining me and uh of course the audience for y'all's participating the video will come out uh in pieces all right here's the thing it was three hours long I didn't realize it was three hours long. So I don't know what I'm going to do video-wise. I don't know if I'm going to do the whole thing or three parts. But when the podcast version of it come out, it'll be the whole thing plus the uh, uh, pre-show conversation that happened with the audience. But uh, I don't know what we're going to do video-wise because it's a lot of fucking editing. And uh, I I don't know. But it'll come when it come because it'll also be the debut episodes of IKF TV where we take some of these podcast episodes that we film um, and break it down into 30-minute episodes. So, you know, if it's an hour, hour and a half show, break it down to 30-minute episodes so it's like a little web series. So that's coming soon, but it will start with the Situationship Live event. Um, kind of Famous Pod on Facebook, K-I-N-D-A Famous Pod, P-O-D. That's where all the show links and all the show information is stored. And also getting these show notes, and that's where you can find the Spotify dope list uh, I'm Kind of Famous podcast playlist. Check that out. Some of the music that I mentioned here will be on there. Um, and I think that's it. Chanel, I very much appreciate you doing this show. We got deeper than I thought we was going to get on this, but we hit a lot of topics um, between Get Out, uh, you know, circling around from episode one um, to talking about Get Out and the, the accolades that it has. We talked about Monique. Talk about women in this industry in general, and then we got in here and talked Black Panther and got into the weeds of the, of, of the Black experience being represented on TV, film, um, and now I guess podcast because podcast life is blowing up. So I appreciate you. I thank you again for coming on, and uh, we're gonna have to do this shit again. Yes, let's do it. All right. <laughs> Until next time, tell your mama say hi. <laughs> So 
So in light of you being kind of famous. Why the hell I'm kind of famous? Who the hell she knows?